Good evening, Barn family. So glad you're joining me here. Tonight I'm going to be teaching on a series that I'm going to be starting here, um, online only. It's called A Closer Walk with God. Like I said, just, just on, online here, um, Wednesday nights on Facebook, and we'll just kind of see where, the, where we go on the other uh, platforms with that. Closer Walk with God. We all want that. We're Christians. Why wouldn't we want a closer walk with God? It's something we want. It's a great goal. But how do we get there? What does it take to become where you have a closer walk with God? Hope this teaching will bless you, help you grow as a Christian. We're going to get into some things. Um, like tonight's teaching is on, uh, are you a disciple of Jesus? We're going to get into things, the blessings and responsibilities of being a Christian, the practice of prayer, uh, looking at studying the Bible, the joy of singing, um, discernment between good and evil, much, much more. Tonight's teaching we're going to jump into, this is going to be, are you a disciple of Jesus? Part one. So let's jump right in. We're going to get right into uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. So if you've got your Bible, look that up. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, and the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So this is uh, commonly referred to as the Great Commission. We've got Jesus here. You know, one amazing thing that you see there. All authority has been given to Jesus. All authority in heaven and in earth. Other Some of the versions, uh, translations say, power, all power in heaven and in earth. If you look around, just the amount of power that you have just in your house is amazing. And that's, that's tiny compared to all, everything on earth and all of heaven. And that's what, what Jesus, Jesus holds and contains. Um, and it hasn't always been that way. Um, You see, in the beginning, God had delegated all the power on earth to mankind. But then when mankind, when Adam disobeyed and fell, um, that power was delivered over to Satan. Therefore, the Lord didn't have absolute control over the earth and its affairs. But then when Jesus died, he descended into hell, stripped Satan of all of his power, and now God once again has all power in heaven and earth. Jesus holds that power. If it belongs to him, then none of the power belongs to you. No power belongs to you. Everything belongs to Jesus. You can have power, but it has to be through the power of Jesus Christ. The Lord gives all power on heaven and earth to you when you go out to evangelize. The Lord is with you. He's always backing you up. So, like I said, that's... that that. Verses, they, were, they normally are referred to as the Great Commission. You'll notice the main thought of Jesus' command is to go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, or to make disciples. That's the goal of evangelizing the world and to, for Christ. Not just to make converts, but it's to disciple. We're not, not here, um, you know, mainly concentrating on church membership and growing big churches and all this stuff, but making disciples is what's that separate themselves from the world and observe the commands of Christ and follow him with all of their hearts, with all their minds, and with our will. You know, we are to teach to all the nations. So, are you a disciple? That's the question for tonight. Are you a disciple? You might... You might be somebody who attends church services regularly, but is that what it means to be a disciple? The purpose of tonight's study is going to be to make it clear of what's involved in being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. To begin, let's define the word disciple. The definition of a disciple is 
the word disciple. That literally means a learner. According to Vine's Expository Dictionary of the New Testament words, it defines it as one who follows another's teaching. But a disciple was not only a learner, but it was also an adherent, someone who, which, that definition of adherent, someone who supports a particular party, person, or set of ideas. For this reason, disciples were spoken of as imitators of their teacher. So what are the goals of being a disciple? So first, stated by Jesus to be like the teacher in Luke 6.40. So you, a disciple is not above the teacher, but you're to be like the teacher. Um, kind of whatever, whatever it is you're learning, you know, like I, I did an apprenticeship, or if you've gone to a university, even just your regular schooling, you know, you never end up learning more than the teacher. You can grow up to be like the teacher, grow as close as you can. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Second uh, goal of being a disciple is to be Christ's disciple. Then it, you, to strive, you need to strive to be like him. As we are taught by Jesus, we grow in him, we become more like Jesus. If we don't strive to be more like Jesus, we're like in Luke 6, 39, talks about the blind leading the blind, and you both end up falling in a ditch. You know, if you're not trying to grow like into being like Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you go to church, you're still going to be this blind leading the blind if you don't let that, that word, the word of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, getting to your heart and change your life, you're going to be like the blind leading the blind. This all lines up according to um, what the Apostle Paul says in uh, Romans 8, 29. It talks about um, God's goal in redemption of mankind, that we're conformed into the image of his Son. So I just ask you tonight, do you have a strong desire to follow Jesus and become like him. Unless you do, it can't be said that you're truly his disciple. You might be a learner, but you can learn all kinds of stuff in a book. But if you don't start following his teachings and let it change your life, it's all just head knowledge. There's also some identifying marks of discipleship given by Jesus, which can help us to, to further identify a true disciple of Jesus. So the marks of a disciple, the first mark we're going to talk about is a disciple is one who abides in Jesus' words. We'll uh, flip over to John 8, 31. It's John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So the Greek word here for disciples is methetis, which means a learner, indicating the thought that accompanied by an endeavor. So this would imply that being a diligent student of the teachings of Christ, it would also require one to be a doer of the word. We'll jump into Matthew 7, 21 through 27. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, the people... The people who thought that they had prophesied or cast out devils or, or did all these wonderful works were deceived. They weren't doing any of these things. Many people today think that signing a card, joining a church, being baptized, many other, you know, quote, wonderful works will produce salvation. But they're deceived as well. Religious doctrines of man have perverted people's understanding of the supernatural gifts of God. They think they've been used 
of God to minister to others and perform miracles when they're actually performing miracles from their own ability. And if that's all as deep as you've gotten with your relationship with Christ, he's going to say, I didn't know you. You were doing these things on your own. And then we'll continue here. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. So doing the sayings of Jesus is, is, the, sure, is the, the sure safeguard against self-deception. We need to do what Jesus says. Get in the word, figure out what he says to do and then do it. It's real easy. Now, it can be easy. Doing the sayings of Jesus is, is, is always the best way. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. See the difference here? If you build your house on the rock, the rock of Jesus Christ, the rock of Christ's teachings, that hand or that 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 foundation, that house will stand. Christians are always going to have kind of storms and problems come against them. But whatever what your foundation is built on, that's what makes the difference. That's what makes the change. You can't get through this world without having storms and, and problems. But if you're rooted on the word of God, you will stand just like this house built on a rock. Another one we want to jump over to is uh, James chapter 1, verse 21 and tw through 25. So James 1, 21 through 25. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So in view of this, a true disciple would not fail to study the Bible diligently. This is on your own. You know, wouldn't find that, that personal quiet time every day. Um, so a true disciple would, would, would not would not fail to do this. So a true disciple would constantly be getting into the Bible, studying, figuring out what the Word says, um, you know, even getting into looking at different, you know, commentaries and, and, and seeing different points of view. Um, another thing would, uh, a true disciple would not willingly refrain from opportunities to study with others. Uh, this includes like Bible classes, church services, um, you know, certain conferences, gospel meetings, you know, a true disciple would, would make it a point to try and make this happen. I understand we've got a life that we live, things come up, you can't be at every one of them. Not, no, no shame, no judgment on, uh, you know, on anything, but if you have the opportunity to, you should try and get out. You should try and learn more, you know, get into Bible studies or Bible classes. You know, if you've got an opportunity to go more or get into a Bible college or whatever the Lord's leading you to, you know, definitely take advantage of those things. It will only help you grow in your walk with God. And that's, that's what we're talking about tonight. Next thing we're going to talk about is a disciple is one who loves the brethren. A disciple loves the brethren. So we're going to look over at John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. John 13, 34 through 35. That says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So here you say, Jesus didn't say that everyone would know that you were his disciples by your doctrines, by whatever rituals you, you follow, you know, by, by our hatred for sin. That's not what everybody's going to notice. They're not even going to notice, by the way, that we express our love for God. But it says our love for one another, our love for the brethren, how we take care of each other. With a love patterned after the love of Jesus Christ, where he says, as I have loved you. And it says, with a love that is visible to the world, where he says, by this all will know. So therefore we know that a true disciple would make every effort to get to know his brethren. Get to know people in church. Get to know somebody that is around you and you have the opportunity. Or if it's somebody at work, just get to know, get to know each other. Spend time together. Take advantage of occasions to encourage and grow closer to them. You know, some of the examples of this would be like attending church on Sunday or on Wednesday nights. Um, you know, it's not always necessarily that you should be in church just for you. You know, there's people at church that need you there. There's people that, that you can change their life just, just by your witness and your love for them. Remember that a disciple is one who wants to become like his teacher. Was Jesus willing to sacrifice his time and effort for his brother? Of course, yes, he was. And so will we if we're truly Jesus' disciples. This is our distinguishing mark, our love. Christians must befriend each other in trials, be careful with each other's feelings, and deny ourselves to promote each other's welfare. We always want to be looking out and putting somebody else's feelings and their welfare above our own and help just show the love of Christ. That is how we're going to know. That's how people are going to know that we're truly a disciple of Jesus. And that will open up the door for them to want to become a disciple of Jesus themselves. The next thing we're going to look at is a disciple is one who bears much fruit. We'll go over to John 15, chapter 15, verse 8. Once again, that's John, chapter 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. By this, my Father is glorified. That's the Lord. My Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. If you notice here, much. There's much fruit, not just an occasional. Jesus isn't talking about an occasional good deed. You're not going to be known as a disciple because you just went and helped an old lady over the street across the street one day. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a lifestyle which promotes people and glorifies God. Matthew 6 or 5:16 says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. This is so important that failure to bear much fruit will result in being severed from Christ. John 15 verses 1 through 1 and 2. You flip go back a few verses. says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So how can we be a, di a disciple of Jesus if we've been cut off? The point should be clear. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ means much more than just being a casual church member. It requires commitment, especially in regards to the teachings of Christ, love of the brethren, 
bearing fruit to the glory of God. The kind of commitment involved is seen when we consider the high cost of discipleships demanded by Jesus in Luke 14, 25 through 33. That's Luke 14, 25 through 33. When you follow me as my disciple, you must put aside your father, your mother, your wife, your sisters, your brothers. It will even seem as though you hate your own life. This is the price you'll pay to be considered one of my followers. Anyone who comes to me must be willing to share my cross and experience it as his own. And he cannot be considered to be my disciple. So don't follow me without considering what it will cost you. For you would construct a house before first sitting you would how, for who would construct a house before first sitting down to estimate the cost to complete it? Otherwise, he may lay the foundation and not be able to finish. The neighbors will ridicule him, saying, look at him. He started to build, but couldn't complete it. Have you ever heard of a commander who goes to war without first sitting down with strategic planning to determine the strength of his army to win the war against the stronger opponent? If he knows he doesn't stand a chance of winning the war, the wise commander will send out delegates to ask for the terms of peace. Likewise, unless you surrender all to me, giving up all you possess, you cannot be one of my disciples. Jesus demands loyalty, and he demands love from us greater than every attachment that we have, even our own families. Jesus wants loyalty above everything. Whoever wants to be Jesus' disciple must first decide whether he or she is ready to pay the cost. As long as we're in this body, we're consistently at spiritual warfare. Christ finds you worthy to be in his army but you need to count the cost to fully understand what Christ's service entails. I'm going to wrap up. That's everything I've got for tonight. I love you guys so much. Just meditate on these things. If you need to go back and watch this again, you know, I know there's a lot of, a lot of information, a lot of Bible study. Uh, we're going to get back into this again next week. And, um, I just really look forward to it. Continue on, stay in the Bible, keep learning about Jesus. We love you guys. Look forward to seeing you guys soon. Take care. Bye.